Hello friends, welcome back to Colliding Worldviews. It's great to have you with me here every single week. And today, just like every other week, I have a guest, a very knowledgeable guest about a particular topic. And actually, we're doing two topics today, as usual. We're going to do this first episode, and then in our second episode, we'll be featuring our great guest as well. And it is none other than Dr. R. Scott Smith, the professor of Christian apologetics at Biola University. If you haven't been to his website yet, you can just go to rscottsmithphd.com and check out all the different articles that he's written. You can even sign up to receive his uh, updates via email as well. Dr. Smith, it's great to see you again. Thank you. It's great to see you too. Today we're talking about a couple of vital topics that many people are not uh, aware of. However, will uh, greatly explain uh, the day and age that we live in today sure. when people mm -hmm. are talking about science and social justice and all of that. So in this first episode, the scientific revolution and how we view science and religion. In the next episode, we'll obviously be talking about the new, quote unquote, social justice. But what are some of the traits of the medieval Aristotelian paradigm for science? Well, that paradigm is what uh, preceded the rise of the scientific revolution. And by and large, you know, it endured throughout the Middle Ages. Um, uh, on that kind of view, science was more uh, metaphysically and theologically based, and uh, it was done more in principle, a priori, rather than the emphasis put today upon going out and conducting empirical you know, kinds of observations. And the Aristotelian model, in keeping with his kind of philosophy, appeal to uh, essences, essential natures to things, something that was truncated, of course, with uh, the rise of Darwinism later, and also these uh, universal kinds of qualities that, uh, like for humans, for example, all share in a common human nature, uh, a human essence. Uh, same with plants, animals, these sort of things have their own natures. And that... Uh, he thought, Aristotle thought, that there is even an essence for the whole universe. Uh, a little bit more on that, too. During the Renaissance, though, when that came about, uh, it led to some increased desires for some empirical investigations, more drawings being done, uh, gardens, uh, new discoveries. And there was also a challenge uh, raised from a development of a, the Platonic mathematical school, uh, so there were challenges, cracks, you know, starting to appeal or appear rather in uh, the Aristotelian paradigm. And there were even uh, some discoveries being made of new species that Aristotle knew nothing about. So there was a, a growing interest in much more empirical kinds of observations uh, that took place. Now, if people haven't read any of this, so this is new information to them, which I'm sure it could be. Again, Dr. Smith is a professor at Biola, so if you, if you don't have a master's degree in apologetics or haven't even read a book on apologetics, it would be, be able to get – it would be good to get some, and you will get more of this, obviously a lot more than we could give in a 28-and-a-half-minute episode. <laughs> Dr. Smith has multiple books he's written as well, so you can get more of that. But, Dr. Smith, uh, who are some of the key players in the scientific revolution – and uh, what were some key shifts that they made? Well, one of the shifts came about in approximately the, the 1300s with a Franciscan friar named William of Ockham. And instead of these universal kinds of qualities like Aristotle thought, and, you know, like all humans share in a literal common human nature, um, he rejected that kind of idea that there were these universal qualities. Uh, Occam instead embraced a view that's called nominalism. Um, that is, uh, you know, if we say something's nominal, it means it's in name only. And so we may call, you know, uh, each human, we say, well, well, they're all humans. But literally, there's in each case a particular human and another particular human and a particular human with literally nothing in common, you know, that they all share in. Just individual qualities, you know, on his view. And another thing with this is that he thought, you know, all these qualities have to be located in space and time. Now, if you think that's the case, you're going to tend to think that, um, you know, those sort of things are going to be empirically observable and probably not immaterial. So there's a there's a, an impetus that comes from this shift that gets us to want to start focusing on what is 
uh, material and uh, available to the five senses. And when we're looking at this topic and we are studying history and how these different philosophers talked about these things, it's important for people to know that many times if you go to a secular university and you study philosophy, you don't actually study philosophy, you study philosophers. <laughs> That's why it's so much better to study philosophy at a, at a Christian seminary uh, or Bible college because you're going to study um, metaphysics on top of the uh, yes. study of being, yeah. etc., and very important to get this information, especially if you are a Christian, because then you can talk about the philosophy, the handmaiden to theology that undergirds it. Uh -huh. Many times bad philosophy leads to bad theology, and good philosophy leads to good theology. So very good to, to be uh, aware of this kind of stuff. Uh, how did evangelicals in the U.S. tend to respond to these new scientific views? Well, uh, very interesting ways. Um, let me lay a little more groundwork uh, before we you know, get to that, though, uh, that'll help explain a little bit more of that kind of mindset, because evangelicals here were deeply influenced by the prestige that came out of the revolution uh, for science. But here are some more reasons how that happened. Um, after Occam, and this is early 1500s and 1600s, uh, there was a shift going on you know, to the same empirical kind of approach to things. And two philosophers, uh, Pierre Gassendi, uh, an Italian philosopher, and then Thomas Hobbes, a British one, they helped revive uh, an older Greek view called atomism. And it was from a guy named Democritus. And the idea here is that the, the material world is basically made up of atoms in the void, Atoms are what are ultimate, you know, the ultimate constituents of reality. Uh, there are no universal qualities, you know, on that, you know, kind of view. Um, and the scientists then in the early modern period picked up on more of this, and they started to wed this um, idea of atomism together with what was called a, a mechanical philosophy. That is, uh, they thought of the universe and the rest of creation as like a, a large-scale machines. Put together, you could call it a mechanical atomism. And there are some key uh, examples uh, in the field of science you know, with this. Uh, Galileo, uh, Francis Bacon, uh, Robert Boyle you know, as well. But they held a key difference from the old uh, Greek view from Democritus. And... They, they, because of the influence of Christianity in Europe, uh, it wasn't like they were all prepared to just say, uh, well, let's, you know, get of, you know, get rid of any sort of, you know, theological ideas and of immaterial sorts of realities. But they, they had to find a way to synthesize them. And the way they did it was this. Uh, they thought that this mechanical atomism applied only to the material realm, not the spiritual so things like the mind or soul or angels or God. And so you got this bifurcation in the view of what's real, even as early as the mid to late 1500s. Um, so what they thought was is that the things of matter, what's material, have what's called our primary qualities, uh, things like size or shape or quantity or uh, you know, location. That forced them to make another distinction and says, well, there, there are uh, things we'll call secondary qualities like uh, colors or tastes or maybe smells. They're not, they weren't thought to be you know, properties of matter. So they, they figured that they're either subjective, you know, just in the mind you know, of, of someone who's observing these things, or maybe these are just names we use you know, for things. And that fits right in with the spirit of nominalism, in name only. So those kinds of qualities were not thought to be real, objectively real, in the world. Uh, Boyle was an example of this. Um, he thought that uh, these uh, so-called secondary qualities and uh, the universals you know, that Aristotle talked about, like um, uh, uh, immaterial soul or things like uh, the color red that could be in many, you know, the same color could be in many things at the same time. They were just didn't make sense to him. They were unintelligible due to how he conceived what was real in the material world. 
And, and this pushes us more and more to a nominalist kind of view. And one of the things that just I think is a key takeaway from all this is to just observe already here how much the philosophical views are driving these views of science and the, their views of what science says is real rather than going out and making empirical observations. It's, it's a philosophy that's driving much of this. Uh, Bacon, you know, comes along and uh, he rejected a couple of Aristotle's kinds of causes. Uh, you know, one of them is that we have a certain kind of form or essence to us that, you know, wants to realize a certain kind of goal, you know, to become a mature human being, you know, for example. Um, and he said that, you know, instead, well, he did that because that is a soulish kind of, you know, quality. My, my goal in life, you know, would be to become a mature human being because that's the kind of thing I am. Well, he rejected that and said in, instead focused on the, the nature of the matter making up, you know, something like a, a living being, like a human, and just simply the, uh, the, the efficient causes, one state of matter causing another state, you know, and another physical state, and, and that's where he focused. So his focus is on experimental, you know, um, kinds of empirical observations, and he too, you know, was anomalist, you know, in all this. But Dr. So, Smith, uh, real quick, even though many people are not aware of these terms and they're not uh, familiar with these names who you're talking about, yeah. uh, bits and pieces of this are, are held uh, subjectively by a lot of people today, especially when you're talking with non-Christians, correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, the idea is even if you couldn't, you know, name, you know, particular individuals or all the particular moves made along the way, uh, yes, I think the overall pattern has become deeply entrenched, you know, in people's minds. Uh, everything's material. There are no essences to things. Um, science, we'll see, you know, gives us the corner of the market on knowledge, you know, through empirical observation, all rooted in what they think is real. <laughs> Mm. And, and these are the shifts. One of the interesting things to me with all this, it says, is science doesn't have to be done this way. But it's the way the philosophy helped develop in conjunction with the rise of uh, modern science that has led us to our mindsets today, you know, about science being the be-all and end-all of, you know, or, or largely so, of, of giving us knowledge. And that's exactly why evangelicals need to be sure that they are at least a little bit, studying philosophy by Christian philosophers, uh, studying science. Don't be afraid of it. Don't avoid it, thinking that it completely contradicts Scripture and con contradicts what is uh, real in this world. It actually undergirds it, and you can, again, use philosophy to back up our Christian apologetics and to undergird our theology and so on. So I want to encourage people to to look into this more. Uh, hopefully this episode is just whetting your appetite to get more. So That's well said. Um, you, you asked a while ago how um, these mindsets affected uh, Christians, uh, you know, in, in the United States in particular, and not just there, but um, <clears throat> some of these key uh, attitudes and mindsets. Uh, in this country, um, Francis Bacon's um, kind of methodology a scientific methodology, um, an inductive kind of one made on by empirical observations. Uh, this was just strongly revered here in the U.S., um, broadly speaking, and Christians picked up on it. Um, they, they thought uh, that his methodology should be applied to all disciplines, and that included theology and biblical studies. Theology was to be done as a science, um, which puts a focus in light of the context here immediately on what we can observe empirically, you know, with our senses. That has an unfortunate um, connotation because you're going to focus on, again, what's empirically observable, like the written text of Scripture, but subtly it starts to distance us from really taking seriously the reality of the immaterial aspects about you know, reality of, of which Scripture speaks. Uh, there were some replies you know, made to Bacon uh, in this country, uh, an appeal to what was called common sense realism, 
Um, Thomas Reed founded that. Uh, that had a real strong emphasis upon our reason's abilities to know universal truths as they really are. And uh, our, our faculties are good enough to know objective truths and be objective in how we go about knowing those things, you know, neutral, you know, in that. But there's, even though I agree that we, you know, we you know, can use reason to know, you know lots of things, there is still an, an overemphasis here, I think. There is too much confidence in human reason's abilities uh, in this mindset. And, and that reflects the times. Uh, this is in the heyday of the Enlightenment, when there was huge confidence you know, placed on uh, human abilities. So this common sense realism was widely embraced by evangelicals here. And as George Marston, uh, in his book called Fundamentalism in American Culture, um, he, he wrote that the careful observation and classification of facts, that's the end of the quote, could be discerned by our objective common sense. And it was, a, it was applied as a general methodology to reliably and clearly know facts of the matter. So this confidence in our, our reason's abilities you know, to simply, you know, know what the truth is. Um, part, part of the result, though, from that, uh, you know, came, you know, with, um, there was a mindset that developed amongst evangelicals here is like, well, if, if, if we can just clearly recognize, you know, what the truth is, you know, and, you know, from scripture, um, then there's no big need for us to try to figure out how to integrate Christianity with the various disciplines, like science, for example. And so basically those sort of disciplines, especially science, were left to develop on their own independently without real attempts needed to integrate them with scripture because they thought it was just a matter of common sense, you know, that at the end of the day, mm -hmm. what their findings, you know, say will reconcile with scripture. <laughs> well, when they let science develop that way, Later, when Darwin, you know, Darwin's theory got accepted, um, they were unprepared to deal with it because mm -hmm. on their views, you know, hey, what science will, you know, says, you know, we'll just reconcile with scripture. They were caught flat footed and, and unable to really respond, you know, adequately, you know, to that. So, you know, with all this kind of um, focus, they uh, started to develop um, this again, this focus on, you know, being rational and knowing, you know, what the, uh, being objective and what the mind can tell us. And they felt like, you know, any appeals to religious experience became too subjective. So that's where you see some rise of uh, movements of, um, you know, liberal Christianity, which appeal to experience as its foundation rather than the scriptures. And also some other religious movements arose in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s, Mormons, um, Pentecostals. Uh, that, you know, caused deep suspicion, you know, because for evangelicals because they were based on so much on religious experience, you know, as well. And to them, this sort of appeal was just too subjective. And they wanted to hold on to the objective truth in an empirically accessible scripture. Um, you know, that there was such a strong emphasis put upon the mind and our objective knowledge that uh, in, in some ways, uh, I think you could really almost discount the importance of the heart, you know, relationship with God. Hmm. Um, and also, you know, just with all these kinds of factors, you know, that were in place, the mindsets changing here, that with a mechanical atomism, everything's material, um, in that case, the universe is a closed mechanism. Well, how on earth then, you know, is God going to intervene or show up, you know, in our lives this way? And subtly, you know, with this confidence also on our reason being so good, there's less and less of a need or expectation that God will even show up intimately in our lives. Amen. So some pretty interesting factors, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think what scares a lot of people too is that when they when they don't know any apologetics and they are confronted by someone who says that they're an atheist or agnostic or what have you, they bring these topics into the conversation, and right away we think, oh, uh, there's no way to answer that from Christianity because all I have is the Bible. But we figure 
if if there is a God, which we know there is, and creationism is true, which it is, then there has to be a way to talk about every single one of these uh, disciplines or topics from a <laughs> Christian worldview. And that's why we as Christians, as 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, need to be ready to give a defense for why we believe what we believe and know what we believe and why we believe it. And mm -hmm. we can easily, as long as you study, you can prepare to – when necessary, when the other person brings up these topics, uh, respond uh, in a loving way, but also uh, based on fact, truth, yes, the Bible. But again, we can use uh, scientific discoveries and also philosophy to our advantage when we yeah. are aiming to share the gospel with someone as well. Very good. Yeah, well well said. All those things are you know very helpful. And one of the things that you know I think is um, – become really interesting for me to study like this the study in terms of how did historically um, the scientific re revolution develop and how did the mindset shift you know yeah. in that studying some of the history of this was just really eye-opening for me as well as when I you know studied some of the history and development of ethics um, how things shifted along those lines too uh, it, it's just insightful to get a, I think, a, a, a bigger picture view. And um, one book I'd sure recommend on this uh, is uh, George Marsden's Fundamentalism in American Culture. Really okay. fascinating study. Yeah, yeah. I know, I believe, uh, Os Guinness in one of his books talks about mm -hmm. this polarization between the head and the heart and this more okay. focus on piety, thinking, oh, well, this is getting too intellectual for us, so we just need to focus on sincerity, piety, uh, being devoted uh, to uh, scripture, and that's it. And we can see when we study Christian apologetics how we can have both. We don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater, chew up the meat, spit out the bones of philosophy, <laughs> of science, and so on. And again, use it to our advantage when we're making a case for Christianity. Now, this, this fact-value split uh, that, uh -huh. that we're talking about here uh, it's ob obviously affected culture. So um, how, how has it affected culture, though, as far as Christians and others? Well, um, in many ways here, we, we've already seen uh, kind of the groundwork being laid for it when I described how uh, in the 15, 1600s, we have the split between primary and, and secondary qualities, uh, the, the hard properties of matter versus ones that are supposedly just properties of the mind or just, you know, maybe words we're using. So the stuff that's, you know, science can measure, that's what's real, you know, thought to be real. The stuff that uh, science can't measure, like uh, what colors, you know, we seem to be observing and things, they're just, you know, subjective to us at best. Uh, those are just, you know, subjective opinions, um, things like that. Well, this gets carried on further. And, uh, you know, later in history, uh, a philosopher named Immanuel Kant uh, introduced the idea that we can't know things as they really are in themselves, but only as they appear to us. So we, we, what do we, how do we know how things appear to us? Well, we observe them empirically. And that's the stuff on the basis of, you know, what we can go out and know by science. That fits right into the, you know, sciences as we understand them now. But we can't know them as they, those things as they really are. And, uh, you know, in themselves, he says. And th this kind of move, you know, caught on. And science got baptized with enormous prestige because of this. Because science then gets baptized with the credentials of being able to give us knowledge. Here we can know things how they appear to us. What they really are, you know, like uh, are they made up of secondary qualities? Are they do they have essences? That's questions for metaphysics maybe or theology. Mm. But that kind of stuff is not the sort of stuff we can have knowledge about, you know, in this kind of view. Yeah. Well when, when, you, when you have that kind of mindset coming in here, Kant thought with that, there's all sorts of stuff. Well, he, he wanted to hold on to and says, um, he said that, okay, in, in order for me to make full sense of ethics, uh, in, in his case, he thought, 
we've got to have a soul that can, you know, grow and become perfect in virtue. That for him, he thought, means the soul's got to be immortal. But how can you know that on his view? Uh, you, you can't. Yeah. It's it's just a postulate or a posit you make to make his views work. Well, what if you don't have good reasons to think there's a, a real soul after all? Or um, what uh, he said that again to make ultimate sense of ethics, God you know needs to be in the picture. God must exist. <laughs> or God exists. Yeah. But again, and uh, obviously when people read your that. books, they're going to see the cases that you make for the subjective morality based on God and so on. Uh, Dr. Smith, we only have a couple of minutes left. I know this is definitely whetted the appetite of people who want to now dive <laughs> deeper into these subjects, but please give a quick assessment uh, on this and a closing statement. Something, you know, I think to uh, think about with this is uh, the whole nominalist idea, you know, that's running throughout this whole development of science and has led us to this point. It's a been an assumption here. And the naturalistic, you know, Darwinistic, you know, kind of views of today trade upon this. There are no essences to things. Everything is just particular. Well, you might say when we think of something that is particular, a particular what? Well, let's say a particular human, you know, like like me or or, or you, Tony. But in that case, you know, it seems like we have a, a particular and then a particular quality, a particular uh, human here. Um, and with that, you know, it's like we have um, a quality, the human, but then particular, like I'm human one, let's say, you're human two, and one's listening could be human three, four, five, six. Hmm. But one of the things with nominalism is it says everything is just one thing. It's just a simple one, you know, one thing. So it seems like we're talking about them as though they are, you know, uh, a particular thing. So that's why I put the one, you know, for the particular and a thing for human. Well, it, 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 that seems to have a problem with it because – now it seems like we're treating each of us as two kinds of things put together, a like a one for a particular or particularizer, and then the thing, the human. But there really aren't yeah. two things. There's only one. In so reality, we, we have the can, same whatness but a different who-ness. Yeah, and you can get <laughs> rid of either one of these without any real loss in reality because nominalism says everything is just one thing. So, so what happens if we get rid of the particularizer, I call it, the, like the number one? We have then just human. Hmm. But that seems like a general quality, something like yeah. universals appeal to. And if that's the case, that means the death of nominalism because they can't allow for universals. What if you do it the other way around and you say that there are you, – you get rid of the quality, but you just have a one you know, left or a two – now you've got an individuator or a particularizer, the number, but no quality. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason in principle, I, I argue, why nominalism can't be reduced to the view that there are no qualities in reality whatsoever. Yeah. If, if that's the case, then there's nothing for science to observe. There are no scientists. <laughs> there are none of us. There are there's nothing left in all creation, you know, even, and that's absurd. No one could live like that. Yeah. Now, now and, that leads. Us. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, and definitely, like I said, people are, are going to want to get more of this. I want to point them to your books. Point them to studying these topics. Uh, get good books by Christian philosophers. Dr. R. Scott Smith is one of them. And I want to thank you for being here on Colliding Worldviews. In our next episode, we're going to get to the new social justice. Uh, God bless you, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much for your work. And I want to point people to your website once again. Thank you, Tony. Friends, we're going to get into the new social justice in the next episode. You do hear that term a lot nowadays. So you definitely want to stay uh, tuned to our channel for that. And again, main thing here, we always get to get, get back to the gospel, getting that out to all people. And we'll see you in the next episode of Colliding Worldviews.